The next speaker in this lineup is the penultimate one, uh, Emily Knessa. Emily is a PhD student in Yatrib, Dr. Yatrib Hathud's mm -hmm. proteomics lab at the School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences mm -hmm. in Binghamton University. There she has been developing Silac and Silam MS methods to characterize the dystrophin associated protein complex in healthy and dystrophic skeletal muscle based samples, including ones in animal models and patients. This work, some of which she'll present here today, aims to facilitate our understanding of Duchenne and Becker mus muscular dystrophy pathogenesis. Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. So my name is uh, Emily Kinesa, and I am a PhD student, PhD student in Dr. Dr. Patrick's lab. Ours is a proteomics lab where the goal is to identify, quantify, and validate different protein biomarkers in Duchenne muscular disease dystrophy in order to study disease progression. For my thesis, I am studying low abundant protein biomarkers in biomarkers in muscle tissue and developing mass spec geometry methods, methods to quantify them. In this case, I will be going over an investigation of the discipline associated protein complex and going over different silent strategies we use to study it. So first, as an overview, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD, is an X-linked disease caused by a mutation of the dystrophin gene. This is an out-of-frame mutation that results in no dystrophin protein being produced. It has an occurrence of one out of 5,000 live male births and results in loss of ambulation by ages 10 to 13. In later teens to 20s, different medical issues can arise such as cardiac arrhythmias and respiratory issues. Untreated, DMD has an estimated lifespan of only 20 to 25 years. Treatments such as corticosteroids, which are anti-inflammatories, can help to extend lifespan by preventing a chronic inflammation um, from developing in patients, but overall it is still a very debilitating, debilitating disease with no true um, source. One of the other components that we that is central to the disease, the disease is a dystrophin associated protein complex, which is my main area of study. This is a low abundant protein complex, um, and the members of this complex exist in this, in about the same amount as the um, di protein dystrophin, which has an occurrence of 0.002% of total muscle lysate, of total protein and muscle lysate. The complex exists uh, to maintain fiber integrity, integrity during contraction and relaxation, and different protein members, such as centrifins and dystrobrevin, are also inv involved in important cell signaling mechanisms. Loss of the dystrophin protein disatalizes the complex as a whole, and our goal is to create therapies for DMT patients that allow them to produce their own dystrophin protein. So dystrophin, so when we talk about dystrophin replacement therapies for DMD, there are two main ones I will discuss. The first one is exon skipping gene therapy, where patients with an out-of-frame mutation that results in DMD phenotype are given a drug to restore the reading frame and allow a truncated pro dystrophin protein to be produced. There are also microdystrophin gene therapies, where an AAV delivery vehicle containing a sequence encoding a microdystrophin protein construct are administered patients so that way their cells can produce a dystrophin protein. The goal of these treatments is to provide, provide patients with therapies that will allow their cells to produce functional dystrophin protein. And what we want to know is how much protein is produced by these therapies and how effective is it as acting as a dystrophin protein. In order to do this, this requires sensitive quantification methods. And in our case, we use Silac. I will be going over those next. So there are a few different Silac strategies that I'll be going over. The first is a standard spi Silac spiking approach, where you have an unlabeled sample that is spiked with a heavy standard that closely matches what is being studied. In our case, that is muscle. We are, we're looking at muscle. And we culture heavy labeled uh, myotubes, spike them and we're able to quantify the relative 
uh, abundance of our sample and compare it to other samples. By using the Silex Bacon approach, we can actually accurately and specifically quantify low abundant proteins in skeletal and muscle life state. Another approach is Silex Pulse Chase, where a subject is fully labeled, um, and over time, the amount of labeling the over and after a certain point, there is no more labeling. And we can track the loss of heavy signal over time, to measure it, and use that to quantify protein turnover. I will first be going over the pulse chase example in our previous and going over previously published results where we looked at the protein turnover and exon skipping treated mice. In this experimental model, we had mice that were, we had wild type and MDX mice. Um, they were initially got, went through an acclimation period given unlabeled feed provided by Cambridge Isotope Labs. Then they were given heavy labeled feed over a 10, 15 day period. And following that, they were given normal feed. And um, this, was, this was called our chase period. By looking at the relative isotope abundance that are the so sorry so relative isotope abundance increases over feeding of heavy lysine, and when that um, when that feeding stops, that is our unlabeled cheese period. Different proteins degenerate and regenerate at different rates, and we can track this rate of degeneration and regeneration and determine individual um, individual turnover rates for different proteins. In this example, protein A has a longer turnover, turnover than protein um, C. Protein A has a higher half-life as well than protein C. So these are the main questions that we're trying to, to, to answer with this study. Number one is how does the protein how does protein turnover of truncated dystrophin and exon skipping treated mice compare to full-length dystrophin and wild type mice? And two, how does the presence of truncated dystrophin affect the stability of DAPC proteins? In order to do the, to study this, we had developed a parallel reaction monitoring mass spectrometry assay. In this case, lysates from um, pulse chase labeled mice were um, were ran on a at, across different time points, were fractionated on a gel, and different pro and different bands containing proteins of interest were excised. In this example, we have dystrophin and dystroglycan. The bands were indel digested with trypsin, and peptides were extracted and ran on our targeted using our targeted LCMS method. So for, for the proteins that we looked at, there was dystrophin, laminin alpha-2, and alpha dystroglycan, which are more central DAPC proteins, titan, which is a more a protein to mark muscle degeneration, and then filament C as more of a control that isn't related as related to muscle degradation. To do our quantify, to do, to do quantification, we targeted the following MS peptides, and you can see that all peptides end with the lysine residue because we are giving the mice the lysine, the lysine feed, heavy lysine feed. This allows us, we tracked each peptide over the um over the 17 days of labeling and the 56 days of chase. And you can see representative skylight chromatograms here to explain the protein turnover experiment. We're from day from co um sorry from day ten of labeling to day seventeen. Labeling was still occurring, so the amount of heavy isotope is increasing. And then from day seventeen to seventy three, heavy feed stopped, and the amount of heavy label decreased over time. We can plot this. We can plot this trend over time in order to see how different treatment groups, MDX treated and wild type, are um, have uh, their proteins turned over. And when we, model, when we normalize to the highest labeling point at day 17, we can calculate a, a, a exponential degree reg decay regression model in order to determine protein turnover. From this, we saw that truncated dystrophin in the treated MDX model has a longer turnover than wild type full length dystrophin protein. We then went to look at those DAPC proteins mentioned before. And in this case, we saw the opposite, where dystroglycan and laminin had double the half life in the wild type as compared to the treated NBX. 
So while we saw improved turnover in the actual truncated district red protein, there was not this, this, this improvement was not reflected in under, other muscle-related proteins. Our future goals are to try to use this experimental model to understand how, pro how DAFSI protein turnover is affected by the introduction of an AAV microdistribution gene therapy. Moving forward, we're going to look at a different topic, Becker muscular dystrophy. This is a mild form of muscular dystrophy where patients have an in-frame mutation that allows them to produce a truncated dystrophin protein. There is a high variability in disease severity in this disease, as well as variable protein expression ranging from zero to over 100% of normal expression. So what we want to understand, well, so in order to understand this disease more in depth, we need to develop a sensitive method for quantifying just different protein over a large dynamic range. Our main question is, does just different expression in BMD correlate with disease severity? In order to study this, we grew, cult we cultured human silic myotubes. To do this, we have myotubes proliferated in silic media containing heavy arginine and heavy lysine. And we lay, we, we, um, we grew these cells until they were fully labeled and did a quality control check to make, make sure that the cells were fully labeled. We then differentiated these myoblasts into myotubes to create a heavy labeled batch of silic myotubes and ensure that they expressed full length dystrophin protein. From there, we proceeded with a, the silic spike in approach where 30 micrograms of non-dystrophic or BMD human skeletal muscle lysate is spiked with 30 micrograms of silic myotube lysate. We then fractionated the samples on gels, on gels, excised the bands as described before, and ran a targeted PRM method. This method has previously been described in the literature, um, or we previously published this method, um, and we were able to show that this method um, can quantify as low as 30, picogra 30 picograms of dystrophin protein, pr proving that is a sensitive method and viable for this study. So one of the key, so this data has yet to be published, so I'm not going too much into depth, but one of the key things we saw is that dystrophin expression does highly correlate with severity and ambulatory status. In the first graph, we have box plots representing dystrophin levels, percentages detected in patients with DMD where no dystrophin protein is identified, patients with BMD that exhibit weakness, and patients with BMD that exhibit no weakness. And there is a clear significant difference between patients with weakness, with, between BMD patients with weakness and with no weakness. This is also reflected in the second plot that shows the proportion of ambulatory patients. Patients with less than with less than 50% of normal dystrophin expression show um, loss of ambulation around the age, a, fra a fraction of the C -less, loss of ambulation by the age of 20 to 30, whereas patients with over 50% dystrophin expression do not start losing ambulation until the, the, until the age of 40. So in conclusion, silic pulse chase labeling provides a powerful method for studying protein turnover. Silic spike and methods allow the, for the quantification of low abundant proteins in clinical samples collected from patients. These novel approaches as described can provide a better understanding of current dystrophin replacement therapies and their efficacy. Our future work, in our future work, we are going to use a silic pulse chase method to quantify DAFSI protein turnover in mice treated to produce microdystrophin. We are also going to use the silic spiking method to quantify DAFSI proteins in BMD muscle biopsies. Here are references you can refer to if you would like to learn more about these studies in depth. And I would think, like to thank the following, um, following people for their health in developing this, these experiments. Thank you, any questions? Thank you, Emily, for that nice talk. There are no questions yet from the audience, but so I'll ask one off the hop. For the isotopin-rich chows and the Cylon work, why did you use uh, 13C6 lysine over other essential amino acids or isotopically labeled pre precursors such as uh, 59 spirulina? So for, because we used um, the, the enzyme trypsin to digest our proteins, that generates peptides ending in lysine and arginine residues. Um, 
for a cost effective measure, we chose only um, to label the proteins with heavy lysine um, instead of doing both lysine and arginine, but it ensured that we would have peptides that we could track for quantification. Okay. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, we'll move forward to the final speaker.